When Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentle man. It's not common to have a neuroscience background. My wife is like the true wild rose of hope. I think I'm like fierce love of transformation. So what comes to me first is this strong sense of how minds, let's say, our thought trains are so given by what we've kind of fed into them. How when we close our minds, our eyes to meditate, for example, or go into a state or in a space where we can notice what is arising in our minds. At least for me, I notice very strongly. Maybe it's images from a film I've seen or a TV series. Maybe it's the conversation I had with someone yesterday. What is very vivid is how the sort of cause and effect, how simple in some ways it is. You watch X, you see this TV series, then you think about it. You know, if you, I especially notice it with films, maybe even the next morning from having watched something the night before because films are so vivid, I think, for us, or moving images. And why remark upon this? Well, I think this is the seed of deep insight about our nature, particularly our mind, which we often think is us. If you're interested in transformation of being, you could say oneself, but it could be a little, a little misleading, but of one's being, out of more interesting, maybe here of the collective being of, of social transformation. How do we, how do we change society? How does society shift? In the most concrete way sometimes, how did we go from having slavery or legal slavery to that being considered absolutely morally abhorrent and illegal and banned? And how did we go from thinking it was obvious that patriarchy was obvious that men were Clearly, only men should have the vote. Women weren't even entitled to vote or hold property, or all of these things that existed for thousands of years to a moment where that's shifted or beginning to shift. And I think noticing that this aspect of the mind, of how thoughts arise, how we think what we think, when we actually look at how our thinking arises, to see this way that in a way it's what we feed into it. It's like I think of it sometimes, the metaphor I come to is of maybe a massive paint mixer going round and round and whatever colours we've poured in, that's what ends up. And I say this because often I, I've had the illusion that I kind of, I thinking my thoughts, I can, and I could just choose to think different thoughts. And I, I would say there's a grain of truth in that which we'll come back to of where there is choice or, or somehow some say of whatever it, it is that has say. But it's really important to have this humility, I think, of, of noticing how much it's simply like, oh, I was watching this film, so I'm thinking that that's just gonna arise in my thoughts, or I listened to this conversation, or I read these newspapers. And if you think of what we've done for ourselves for like, often decades, you've been feeding your mind X, or it's been fed, I would actually prefer to say that, you know, you just started reading some newspaper because maybe your father or your mother read that newspaper. You watch the news or you watch films because it's somehow satisfying, but you watch the films that your culture produces or you read the books that you were set in school. And just think of how much this paint has been poured into the paint mixer and how you know little of it maybe has been chosen. Because the point that follows is that a lot of the foundation of social transformation, of shifts in our society of the kind that I am deeply committed to, a radically wiser, weller world, a world in which we can powerfully address the ecological crisis we're facing, where every child is chosen, cared for and cherished, for example. Every child where you know, of course, these utopian families, but it's no war anymore. 
we act wisely collectively and we have, we have deep flourishing of each of us. Those things, at least I think socially, come about a large part out of mind and what people think and believe. And how does thinking and believing shift? Once upon a time, I was, a, I was very rational, a, r a real rationalist. I thought that people's mind shifted and, you know, by arguing with them in a way, in, in a constructive way, in almost a Socratic way, that through reason, through a certain, I would say, reason-oriented dialogue, people would change their minds. Uh, and it was a great learning, I suppose, for me, or a great even disappointment at some point that that was not the case. I often think actually of my father, and my father was a great inspiration to me. Matt, I really loved him. He was incredibly intelligent, very rational in a way. He was a lawyer, spent his life in a way of a kind of pursuit of truth. I mean, he really was committed. He wasn't a lawyer about winning. He was a lawyer who was really interested in, yes, he was interested in winning, but in, in, in really was caring about the honor and the, 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 the kind of the deep aspect of law, which is the pursuit of justice, which is a pursuit of truth of a kind. Maybe not philosophical truth, but at least truth out there. And, and I think it was always just really shocking at a certain point for me to realize how little I could at least change his mind through reasoned argument. And how maybe how little I changed my mind <laughs> out of reasoned argument. So anyone interested in deep social transformation deep social change, wants to really, funnily enough, consider the nature of mind. This sounds, I think this is not widely accepted, but it's not the case that most people involved even in activism or even in nonprofits or let's say even in government policy making. I've met many people, I've done quite a lot of activism, quite a lot of work with policy makers, lots of work with nonprofits. It's not common to have a neuroscience background, for example, or a cognitive science background, or a contemplative background, which is, I think, another access to investigating the nature of the mind, sometimes a lot more powerful than the scientific approaches, mainly because I think it brings the individual, rather than being an abstract thing I've studied, our cognitive biases, the way that we don't change our minds or that we have these heuristics or errors in our thinking, it brings it very concrete when you investigate in a way yourself, your mind, the nature of mind, the nature of what arises in mind, how little say I have in what arises in my mind. Actually, if it's just like me looking at my fingernail and going, don't grow or grow faster. If you've ever tried that experiment at home, you'll discover that you have very little say in how fast your fingernails grow. And similarly, you actually have very little say in how your thoughts develop. It's mainly based on this kind of most cause and effect of what you've put in, this kind of mixed in and just keeps you know, unfolding. So there's this really profound connection, I think, between understanding or having a better sense of the nature of being of each of us and the nature of mind and you might say political theory and social transformation which for example again if you go to most modern political theory textbooks they do not have long chapters on cognitive science or even if you're interested in more like pragmatic textbooks or I say textbooks research books that you know look at revolutions or how do movement building happen there's much more about like social organization or community organization all of these things which are valuable but it's not often a oh what is what is the buddhist theory of mind or what is the modern cognitive science understanding of the nature of mind and how that changes and that brings me to maybe another point which is if you realize that you're then like okay not only is it what i consume but mainly it's often who i'm around we believe and we think together it is extremely difficult in my experience again i think many people look to think very differently from the people you're regularly interacting with it will be a very painful experience it's actually difficult to do so i think actually almost 
difficult to think differently, but it's also almost emotionally difficult to not conform in some way with other people's thinking. It's very costly somehow emotionally, um, energetically. So there's this real sense in which we believe together, which would then again mean that if you're really interested in transformation of yourself or, or evolution of your being, let's say, and of thinking differently, you really need to think about the situations you put yourself in. And we don't. But in my, why in my experience, I, I haven't thought about that a lot in my life. I mean, first of all, you don't have a lot of say because you're in a family. You grow up or you're in a social context, you're in a school or whatever, that you have, you've not chosen at all. Um, you have very little say in. And obviously it's one huge part of often our development is somehow to break free maybe from the constraints that they have given us. Not maybe to, maybe to integrate them, not to fully reject them, but to not be simply given by them. And not even also just to be given by our reaction to them. You know, we can either be given by our parents or be resisting our parents, you know, on the opposite extreme, but really to have somehow freedom to transcend that context. And I think that that's actually one, as an aside, we come back to a huge aspect of education or even par and parenting is somehow to create the context for us to have a ground, so to integrate what has been given, but for the, our children or others to have really have the space to create or discover for themselves, to, to have insight, not simply to be given something, but to take it for themselves or to discover it for themselves. Something that I think, are obviously, most education systems today and even most parenting today, I don't think is even oriented towards, let alone succeeding in. And it's a big task. I mean, it's not, it's not a uh, small ask, but to come back, there's this profound connection between the nature of being and social transformation. So my contention is if you're interested in social change, to put it in that simple terms, you want even more social justice, you know, the classic things, you want more, more women's rights, we want fairer society, one where you know, economic rewards, I don't want to say rewards, but e economic value is more fairly distributed than the massively unequal world we still see today. Or you want even, maybe I would say, deeper changes where the entire orientation of you know, the capitalist system is shifted or the social paradigm moves forward in a deep way in the way that we see human beings or we see the potential organisation of society. Then you really want to look at how we think, how we come to think. Because I think view, those views and values, the way we think ultimately underpin those deep changes we want, if they're particularly we want them to happen in a well way. I emphasize what I mean is that we can sometimes have change, just as an aside there, what I would say in unwell, we can use force, we can take, we can overthrow in ways and when Ultimately, I think the greatest and the most well changes happen when there's a sort of agreement. Maybe not sometimes it's, we don't have to wait for everyone to agree in a certain, I'm not saying that, but there's a sense in which there's a genuine shift in the views and values of our society rather than some minority taking power by force, <laughs> as has happened. And this is what we also mean by an ontological politics or a politics of being. One, one part of that is that to say that a new kind of politics would take seriously, would focus on, in this double sense both, it would focus on being and our development as a central part of the social project. What we're up to in society is cultivating being, providing the means, the approach, but also that for social change to happen, it would require this work, this inner work of ourselves, particularly, I think, in though, you know, there's always going to possibly be a vanguard or those who are helping provide leadership at the beginning in these kind of changes, really requires this cultivation of being. So in this double sense, it's a politics of being, both in you know, the goals, the ends, in a certain way, a move from an outer development society that we're in today to an inner development society and the very nature of how do profound social 
political change you say had come about, they come about by what gets fed into mind, slowly shifting, and on a collective level. And just to think of how long, for example, the idea of human equality took to become almost a norm. And now, currently right now in this moment in France, you go to any government office, you'll see the words liberty, égalité, fraternité, liberty, equality, brotherhood, sisterhood. But just that equality is a central thing. I mean, I always remember that one of the songs of the Peasants' Revolt in England, in medieval times, was when Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentleman, which was this considered incendiary. I mean, Ball, who was singing that, was I mean, executed brutally, hung, I think hung, drawn and quartered. This idea that, which that's, you know, when, when we were back at this, the beginning, where was this social inequality? Where was the gentleman versus the peasant? It didn't, wasn't there. But this was a completely radical, I suppose, in double sense, idea, both going to the root of our nature and of a society, but also radical in assessing radical social change. So it takes a long time in that paint mixer metaphor to add new kinds of paint for it to gradually... We can accelerate that. We can support that happening. And it comes back, if you want to be groups who are doing that, if you want to be involved in that, and we want to do it skillfully, we want to do it patiently, we want to do it well, to not be caught up in the grasping... The, the sadness and the resentment that comes from necessarily often the failures and challenges <laughs> where one's trying, one's up against a mainstream, whether there's a mainstream or a default, you know, in the mate mixer, it's all, it's all brown right now. Or, I know it's all green and we want it to become pink. It's going to take a long, quite a while. You know, we could try to violently overthrow the green in our paint, you know, push it all out. But if we're going to do it in a wise way, it's going to take time. And to do that, you need a base. We talked about believing together. If we're isolated, if you're just there on your own watching, I suppose, YouTube videos nowadays, you, it's going to be difficult to maintain your pinkness, if you like, metaphorically. So you need to find other people to be around who are somewhat pink. You need, and then to create these kind of seeds that can then gradually sprout and kind of network together. I think this is lovely metaphor of the caterpillar and the butterfly and what I call the, I think, the imaginal cells, where when this point where the caterpillar is, goes into the cocoon and it's going to become the butterfly, initially there are these cells which are sort of the, the future butterfly, and initially when they come into existence, maybe they're kind of killed off by the caterpillar, they're seen as alien, and the existing caterpillars immune system, whatever, will attack them. But when there are enough of them and they c connect together, particularly connect together, they can kind of sort of flip the system and become, start becoming the butterfly. And in fact, the caterpillar sort of then becomes the kind of compost, the, the material for the forming of its, its future self. Obviously, that in this vision of social transformation, you need these imaginal cells. We need to come together those who dream of this radically wiser, weller world, of this second renaissance, need to find places where they can come together, believe together for a time, maintain their faith in a way. When we look at the world today, it doesn't necessarily always give you hope that a radically wiser, weller world or a second renaissance is coming. It can seem like we're in winter, or winter is coming, as that famous phrase now in our cultural lexicon. And it can be hard to see that spring is coming too, that summer is one day coming too. I sometimes think that we should have t-shirts printed with spring is coming. <laughs> Life itself, spring is coming. So also in a prag pragmatic sense, again, this insight about the nature of our minds. That if you're not around others, pragmatically, who share some 
of your views matter. You don't necessarily need group think, there can be lots of diversity, but have some of your shared faith, some of the shared views and values, one will really struggle. At least that could be my experience and the experience of others who I've seen who are close to me. One of my good friends became a monk, a Buddhist monk. I can really see the, that. Why do you go and join the Sangha, such a powerful and such a kind of structured Sangha? Because it's very difficult. We always used to, he and you, I always used to reflect that we could go on retreat, we'd be practicing, we're like, this is so clear, it's important for us to meditate, to practice mindfulness, and we'd come back to London, and boom, a few weeks it would be gone. It would be a memory, not a present. And um, I think it's very, 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 very important to have this humbleness and insight, born of this insight, about the nature of our mind, the nature of our ability to maintain faith and vision. And again, and funnily enough, I, just an aside, we, because we're also we're in a culture where one of the articles of faith, one of the assumptions is, we, you know what you want, you do what you want. The idea is that I do not pursue what I want almost doesn't make sense. It's almost a contradiction in terms. By definition, I must be doing what I want. But that's really, once you have some insight, it's so clear that that is not the case, that often I'm not doing what I truly want. I mean, it's, it becomes more obvious when we think of the extreme, what are often called the pathological cases in our culture, like a addic drug addiction. In these few cases, or even more, you know, smoking, there's a sense of people somehow struggling, and you can see it even acted out where they're in an in a, in a actual struggle to somehow do what they really want. Do they really want to smoke right now or not? Why is it that they're like hiding the cigarettes in their house or, you know, going or, you know, trying to lose weight is another example. But it's often only in these pathological cases that we notice, and again, a prof this profound ontological insight about the nature of our, that our will, so again, the nature of mine, you might say, will and what I think might be a little different, but how I don't necessarily somehow do what I want. And again, once you, I think, start looking, you notice that those pathological cases aren't really pathological. It's happening all the time to each one of us. And again, not only do we believe together, we act together. Again, take obvious examples. If you're in a, if you've ever been someone who smoked a bit and you've been around other smokers, it's very hard not to smoke. Conversely, if you're a smoker within a, like living in a house or living around people who none of them smoke, it's kind of painful a bit. It's hard to smoke. Or well, I don't know, you're trying to eat in a well away and everyone's eating chocolate donuts around you. It's hard not to eat chocolate donuts. Whereas if everyone's kind of, oh, eating really nice vegetarian meals, it's a lot easier. The fascinating thing Again, is even if that people don't act on this insight, I don't often act on this insight because what it tells you is you really want to set up your environment, you really want to set up the people you're with, you really want to organize uh, your life in that way. I mean, it's really worth doing a lot to be in those the right environments or the right groups of people around because it shapes so much of what you're doing. If you're living with people who all meditate at 7 a.m., it's going to be much easier to meditate at 7 a.m. than it is on your own. And again, I, why I'm emphasizing this, and I'm emphasizing it to myself, is what's so funny is I've had quite a few friends in this case who are, you know, share interests in these things. Often if you say, oh, we should live together more or do things. But ultimately, other things have often trumped that. You know, oh, I've, I've got this job got this mortgage which the job helps pay for right? I've got all these there's these constraints and often then those things over maybe you'd say overpower but seem to become seem to end up being more important than these choices about for example living 
with others who you can practice or share the vision with and so on. Maybe now with the online possibilities we have, it's easier to stay in that connection and maintain it. Why well, I continue to think that the, I myself and others massively underestimate that they overestimate how much their own powers of will or of thinking and underestimate how valuable it is to be in some kind of, I would like to say maybe community or intentional neighborhood in some community of practice. Because that's what I want to say is it's so, something so incredible is possible. Something so extraordinary is possible both personally, people, just in the most kind of every day, the quality of life, the joy, the transformation at a personal level is possible. Like really what Jeffrey Martin and others or all spirit, many spirits, fundamental well-being, I like this kind of more secular time, but really a shift in your enjoyment of life, your feeling of you know, transcending fears of death, and they take practice. They take often being around other people who imagine those things are possible, who they often involve meditation or other kinds of practices that are hard. Annoying, you know, it's like, it's so easy to watch Netflix. I have no problem <laughs> doing my Netflix practice. <laughs> it's somehow hard to meditate or sometimes to exercise or whatever these things are. And yet the, what is, possible out of them is so heart-opening, so mind-blowing, if we could use that term. And at the others, and also what's so incredible is that social transformation is possible. It really is possible for us, first as maybe small groups, to live more wisely and well, and then as whole regions, whole societies to shift. You can feel it, a sec we are in a second renaissance. And yet at the same time, if you, you know, I just look around, there's, a, there's still just so much suffering and loneliness and lostness and fear, understandable fear, um, especially for those who have their eyes open and looking at the world today. We are in the midst of a, an unfolding, Ecologic, massive ecological crisis we have. We are playing with technologies, I would say at the moment, far out of our wisdom. Technologies are far more powerful than we have the wisdom to skillfully handle. And we have a tendency at the moment to say, oh, you know, it's like the man who jumped out of the 13th floor. So far, so good. So far, so good. Passing the seventh floor, ah, so far, so good. And something is so possible, something incredible is possible. We're at a moment in human history where oh, several streams have converged. One which is very related to the Second Renaissance is the East and West have kind of re-met. So Western science, I'm not saying it is, but crudely Western science and Eastern wisdom traditions, there are also Western wisdom traditions, there's also Eastern science, but frankly, to put it crudely, have come together. Buddhism, Taoism, many other traditions were unknown in any real deep sense in the West a century ago, or even 50 years ago, properly, 50, 60 years ago. Suddenly now, mindfulness is, is everywhere, for example. And really, I think there's a convergence in the understanding of the mind beginning of the understanding of the mind and more deeply the nature of being, a re-engagement with religion and spirituality that was lost really in modernity in the Western scientific approach and its materialist reductionism. And there's much to admire in Western science, but there were some things that really uh, went too far. And there's also, so that's one incredible stream that's just come together that was not available. And the other is Clearly, you know, just you know, some of our technologies, we never had the opportunity before to communicate across the planet, to work from anywhere to some extent. Even the abundance, which I know is very unequally distributed, but the relative abundance, at least proportionally to human history, you know, there are far fewer famines, proportionally. I'm not saying absolute numbers than there were. Certainly in some pockets of the world we have 
an incredible amount of leisure. I always remember reading, I mean, people were strike in 1910 or so, so just over a century ago, people were striking in England for a 60 hour week in the coal mines. They were, they, that was their ask, was a 60 hour week. That's, those are incredible achievements in many ways and what they present us with is space to cultivate being and there's this possible kind of you know, positive feedback loops that you can then see arising in a moment when we're basically just exhausted, we spend our entire time finding the material resources for existence. Where is the time to cultivate wisdom, to cultivate our being? But as we start to have that time and we start to dedicate well, then that shifts other things. Maybe we start to realize we don't have as many needs as we thought we had. Or we can, you know, there are wiser ways to organize what we do have. And we can start to see those kind of positive feedback loops, groups, maybe first of all, who form, who are able to operate really in a different way, can be successful in a way, even in the old paradigm, in that way, materially, but it's supposed to be psycho-spiritually. People are just like, wow, I, you know, those people look really happy. <laughs> those people seem really joyful. Those people seem really well. I want to be part of that group. I want to, what are they doing over there? That, so they, they seem so content all the time. Not that they don't have tragedies, not that they don't still have pain, not that they don't still have loved ones die, not that they still don't deal with the ups and downs of life, but wow, something's really different about them. And not just the exceptions. I mean, we've always had you know, Ramana Maharishi, we've always had, I don't know, Jesus, or the, you know, depending on your tradition, we've always had Buddha, we've had these, we've always had the monks, maybe, or the exceptional preacher. But we're talking about something different now. An actual society or at least communities that are operating in this way that are, that are not having to simply go a separate path. Who are still, they still have children, they still have jobs, they still produce things, they still make a living. And yet just operating at this different, fundamentally well way. What a dream. You know, it's a dream that is not mine. It's a dream that many have started to have that you could, grateful to my ancestors, to all the ancestors, but, but I call it, it's a pragmatic utopian dream. And it's not a dream of flying cars. It's not a dream of, I don't know, some magical nanotech that can make all the things we want. It's a real utopia, it's a utopia, maybe with the E, the well place, the protopia. It's, and it's a utopia of being, and it's pragmatic, because there are real paths to that place. Right here, right now, there are steps. Let's get a little concrete, so to put all the things that I'm putting together. So. Gonna, you need to start probably with where we communities, or I prefer to say neighborhoods. I don't mean intentional communities where we're all living together and sharing the Swedish hot tub, <laughs> but more like neighborhoods where people are starting to come together to pioneer and try out this way of living and being and operating and producing. What distinguishes it, and I'm not saying that this hasn't already been there in many experiments in the past, but there's really this focus on the kind of cultivation of being, of this awareness of how we think together, of how, what we feed into our mind. And these are, deep, these are teachings there, in, obviously in Buddhism, so on. there are these experiments, whether it's Oroville, which is one of the most, but you know, all across the world for maybe even centuries, but certainly many in the last century. But we're at a point of, I think, critical mass, potentially. Critical potential, a second renaissance. So we start, I think, with that on the one hand, and we still also, we're sharing these ideas in that paint metaphor. Got the paint going around and around, and we start putting in, I don't, know, put, I don't know, I've chosen that color, but maybe more pink or yellow. Maybe I should say yellow, as that's life itself's color. We start feeding that into the cultural 
the discourse, sharing these possibilities and ideas, doing the work to make them credible, to make them concrete, demonstrating them. I mean, I have to say, I think demonstration goes often much further than uh, explanation or reasoned argument about these things. I don't even like the word argument, but reasoned exploration. We need to find the others. We need to connect those imaginal selves that are coming into existence, each one of us or each of these communities. We need to connect. And we need to build a movement. And we need to be very patient. I'm always, I'm inspired by many people. I'm very inspired often by Thich Nhat Hanh. I always think how long, in a way, like it was, uh, I mean, his commitment to the Dharma, but in a sense, I always look and think, wow, it was maybe only at the end of his life that he saw many of the fruits, many things over his whole life, but really, wow, it's only in the, maybe the last couple of decades of his life that it, it, well, it certainly resonated as broadly his message in the culture. And we have to be patient. We have to have that kind of faith that, I don't know, maybe we, that in this manifestation, I'm not going to see all of it at least or even part much of it come into be manifested but like it's like the oak tree its roots have gone down deep and one day it can shoot upwards so we have to have that patience as well i say that to myself i'm a very much child we live in a very impatient age and i'm often have been an impatient person and we have, to, we have to build very sound foundations of our own practice, our own volition. There's so much, there can be so much ego in this. Again, I say this to myself, there can be so much, I have the way, I know the answer, I'm right. So again, we have to walk that thing of, of faith and inspiration and holding the possibility of it without that turning into, it must come to be right now, it must go this way. I think it's very important that we get the essence. I don't want to say always right, but that we, maybe it's not even that there's, that the essence is right, but the, the holders, the groups, the communities holding this essence, holding this faith, are kind of have the, the foundations to be able to hold the, and evolve these kind of dreams, these kind of possibilities. This is what I give my life to. This is what I give my life to, is this possibility this of an awakening society, an awakening world, a world where waking up, cleaning up, growing up, showing up, where cultivating our being in all of our dimensions and all of its riches is, 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 has primacy where personal and collective flourishing is central. It's, that's what I give my life to, it's what I, inspires me, it's what touches me, it's what I'm committed to. I think it, it calls for some new form of leadership. I always feel this is a separate part of this maybe interview, is that, that ultimately we need we need leadership and we are in a moment and going to the details of this but where leadership is very hard i mean just to get concrete one aspect is that one very positive development is currently often an assault on traditional hierarchy at least in the western world a tearing down of even the more subtle forms of oppression and domination that have been around the challenge is that it destroys maybe any kind of leadership. I remember remarking, I saw a photo of a protest at the Gilets Jaunes in France a few years ago, and someone was wearing a vest, and their vest didn't say change the system, change the system, it said fuck the system. And we are in a moment where often it's just screw the system, but we have to have systems of some kind. We have to have leader structures for leadership 
of some kind, even if that moves around. So we're in a very difficult moment for leadership. And yet we need it more than ever. So I think one of the things we really need to do is cultivate a new kind of leadership. And I want to emphasize that it's not just new leaders. It's leaders exist in our listening. Just as that example, if, if all of the attitude around me is fuck the system or screw leaders, you know, who are you to say you're the leader? We'll have no leaders. And funny enough, just to go back to the Gilets Jaunes example, there was a good example there where at some point in the Gilets Jaunes there were four people who, you know, after discussion, were kind of like putting themselves forward to maybe get elected to the European Parliament. And then a load of other people in the Gilets, well, who are you? Why are you putting yourself forward? What? Because, of course, they don't have really any process in the Gilets Jaunes. Well, why are you to say you should get elected? Why not me, etc.? And, of course, it all just fell apart. And so I think we're, we're experimenting, you know, not just we. I mean, as a society, we're still experimenting with what do these leaders, leaders of the future. And I suppose most of all, the listening, the space that we create for leaders to arise in. And that's a big part of our growing up as a society at the moment, somehow, is to both deal with, obviously, all of the oppression and hierarchical, you know, oppression through hierarchy, and the implicit ones, you know, men and women, as different ethnicities, but to a place where we can have leadership again of a kind that really we need. And again, I just want to say on that, the theory, you know, there's many people who've point, made the point that I'm making just there, I think one of the people who makes very articulate is Ken Wilber and many others about this point, and about the difference between domination hierarchies and growth hierarchies, and we need to distinguish those. Growth hierarchies are good, dominated hierarchies not so good. And how does it actually work in practice? And that takes skill. And I think, again, we maybe can't start society-wide. We can't say, oh, well, we need it. You know, we need to do better than, I don't know, Boris Johnson or Donald Trump or, or take the other person if you want at the moment you know, on the other side of the political spectrum. I think maybe this with these experiments where we work out how we actually do leadership in new ways and create the space for leadership in new ways probably is going to start at a smaller scale and grow from there. I don't think we can necessarily do it. It's too, we have too much stuff. I want to end I have a son, he's just about to be four years old. I just love so much. And I love also that one of the things that I have got access to through him, and I remember this was when he was about one and a half. Sometimes he was waking up in the night and I would go to him. And I remember there was a moment where I suddenly, it's a very strong f feeling on the inside, of like I was holding him, but this could be any child. Of course, it's not. It's only I can only give certain attention, you know. So, so much. But the, this love that I felt for him, I want to feel for everyone, for every child that's born. And I know that I really want a world for him that he gets to grow up in, to grow old in, that really works, and that may be the work of generations. Maybe his generation too and the generations after. But, the, but when we think if you have children or you one day may have them, or you don't, you have niece or nephews, or just you feel of the future, it's just like, doesn't that call us forth to take action, to do something, to be something for a future worthy of them to be possible. Rufus is no thing, <laughs> nothing. There's a kind of mind answer to that question. There's like this Rufus is, Rufus is this, Rufus is this. And there's like an abstract, like the nature of being kind of answer. And there's like just personally, who am I? Like, what is my personality in a way, or who am I showing, how am I showing up in the world? So one thing I guess to say a little, a little more spiritual, like, I feel that there's like, this, be, this manifestation is an intersection of an awareness field that's just all pervasive, I mean. And also a sort of 
semi-bounded form, the body, ego, body, mind. So there's a field that's just like gravity, all pervasive in which presence or kind of experience shows up at the intersection. And this ego or this body, mind, this form, which is not perfectly bounded. You know, I have air coming in and out of me, but there's this form and this mind. It's kind of Rufus. That's why people can use useful labels like Rufus, even though there's lots of difficulties with that in the sense of Rufus is clearly evolving in every moment over time. Well, is Rufus now the same as Rufus was 20 years ago? So in some sense, I would say Rufus is an unfolding, a constant becoming of kind of energy. To go back to this paint mixer metaphor, I think sometimes a river maybe is even better, but things are flowing constantly into the river and out of the river. Well, there's this wonderful, I think, metaphor of the whirlpools. Like Rufus is a whirlpool in the energy field of life. It's coming into form, it's evolving and will pass will dissolve back into the stream, will unmanifest. Uh, who, in the more personality sense, who am I? Who, I think the more that, this sort of aspiration, the more that I become just the service, or like this, just letting yourself be whatever is being called at a given moment. You know, in a way, just watching the show. <laughs> we just, stuff just keeps happening. I will keep saying things right now. Am I saying them or they just, you know, I'm not sure there's a Rufus, there's a watcher, there's a witness. And then, as I said, there's this almost cause and effect mostly of just whatever's been prompted. But somehow in this complex, incredibly complex dance of the whole becoming of the, the universe, the world. But also I'm currently a 43 year old male, Caucasian. Yeah, I'm an aspiring, you know, aspiring, very much aspiring bodhisattva of like wishing to give my life to awakening and an awakening world and awakening of others. That's, and also, I'm just so lucky. I mean, I'm lucky in a material sense. I'm lucky to be born in the country where I'm born. I'm lucky to live in a space, place not at war. But I'm most of all lucky to come across, in, for me at least, the Dharma. I'm a Zen practitioner, I just really, that and other practices really, I have touched, at least touched, taste of enlightenment, of the peace, of the joy, <laughs> the non-attachment. And it's a daily practice to be with that and be skillful with that. I think that's, and the other part then is of like training the mind of just being skillful like being you know what a one just to learn to be I'm a I'm a aspiring philosopher as well a lover of wisdom I want to become more wise so who am I um, I am also a father I'm a husband a builder I think building is what like not lit but well I do literally help build buildings but I'm more like the builder of enterprises and, and initiatives and efforts and movements. It's funny, I wouldn't say I'm like, I think the other dream I have is maybe of being a healer or a, or a guide, maybe less a healer. It's funny, so I wouldn't say I was a healer. I wouldn't say I was, I'm not a guru, I'm not a teacher at the moment. But I think aspirations I have is to be more maybe of a guide. I mean, sometimes in supporting people in finding their path, their own like heart wisdom, and their own, and supporting them in kind of discovering and staying kind of committed, staying enrolled with their own kind of true volition. Me, yeah, that's the best way. I'd love to do that more. I started doing a little bit with people, but really helping people find their true calling and staying true to their true calling. Because we often get distracted. I, I well, at least I have done. I see others get, it's easy to get kind of distracted from their true calling. And then also to share, I suppose, I have a bit, this is a secret one, I guess, I don't really dare say it, is to be a, a kind of visionary about this political, this ontological politics, this vision of a new, the second renaissance, and of how it actually shows up, you know, the political theory. So one thing, 
you know, I, I think that, it's, as I mentioned at the very beginning, maybe neglected is how the visions of being, the visions of who human beings are, of our psychology, of our nature, deeply interact with our visions of society. And in ways that are sometimes, because it's the water in which we swim, are just invisible. So, for example, if, you know, to take it very concretely, like Plato has a, in the, in the back at the very beginning of Western political philosophy, you know, the Republic by Plato, Plato has a very clear ontological vision about the forms and about human essences. And then this shows up about society because it's like, well, you know, the perfect, this, this is a perfect kind of forms of the perfect version. There's a kind of perfect version of society, which is sort of the just society. And then there are this whole vision about the nature of peoples, the kind of the, the the, this kind of the elect group, the guardians, depending on your translation, who kind of run this, the philosophers, basically, the philosopher kings. And then you've, you know, just take another example, you know, you let, again, I'm, I'm caricaturing, but you know, you have Thomas Hobbes and like, you know, life is nasty, brutish and short in a state of nature and we're kind of somewhat self-interested or, you know, we need, we need a kind of ruler to bring order. There's these various visions you know, or, you know, on the other end, you know, naive, you know, might say Rousseauing vision, whatever. And I think that exploring that and particularly exploring what our new, what we're starting to see about the nature of human nature. And in particular, I think about how we can cultivate certain characteristics, compassion, how we can heal many of the wounds that I think that we also carry this individuals but almost as collectives through thousands of years wounds of exploitation of war of deep suffering how those can kind of be actually can be healed and transformed and how central you know so i guess a kind of mat i don't want to say malibu but how much we can transform and how much then that transmit transformation can transmit to next generations through culture and through the upbringing that we receive I mean, just to make it very concrete, we now have evidence, you know, let's say a child is brought up in a, either a very, a, a very environment of significant scarcity of food or other things, but also scarcity of love, you know, an environment of abuse or mistreatment or a lack of love, that can profoundly shape their whole life and then how they treat their children. And conversely, if we are brought up in an environment of deep love and care and sufficiency, not necessarily great wealth, but just sufficiency and true love and care, well, that creates an entirely different way of being. I mean, not only of joy for that person or wellness for that person in their life, but also their way of seeing the world, you know, the way they'll vote <laughs> for that matter, or the way that they'll act in compassionately, or the way that they'll in interpret th threats or can see situations. So I think this, we have this really new science, you could almost say, or new integration of the wisdom traditions and Western science that I think creates, implies an entire political program. I mean, I think both it creates a new possibility. I'm really going off now because I think right, right now uh, we live in this complete desert of political vision. I mean, if you think even over the last couple of centuries, I mean, they were turned out, many of them didn't work, but there was incredible imagination and hope about the political, what I would say, political thinking. I mean, you know, going from Marxism to many other areas. And we live in a moment now of great pessimism or great cynicism. And what we really live in is just like small tweaks to our existing system that most of us find at some level abhorrent, actually, I think. When we really look in our hearts, not that we don't think maybe, like, say, capitalism productive, but this idea of the kind of vast inequalities, you know. I, you know, no one can look and think, like, there are people starving somewhere in the world or have incredibly few resources, and then there's Jeff Bezos. No, no judgment on Jeff Bezos, but, you know, or, you know, it, there's just something, like, out about that world. You know, or even, the, let's say, even similar, the employees of Amazon. You know, that there are these people, all these people in warehouses, and then there's Jeff Bezos. You know, it's just like, you know, that doesn't somehow work. You know, it doesn't seem well, I think, ultimately, even for Jeff Bezos. <laughs> and, you know, not to say that I'm not a beneficiary of those kind of systems, by the way, nor absolutely. Um, and that there's something, you know, so I'm, you know, I'm implicit in many of these things, uh, complicit as well. But yeah, that there's really, we live lived in this age of kind of a total absence of political imagination and excitement and possibility.
And so I think there's something really exciting that opens up and it's kind of a jiu-jitsu move rather than it's like, oh, we have a new system or a better version of socialism or, or you know, a better governance system that will work. You know, we're going to have citizens' assemblies. I mean, sure, I think that's amazing. But I think the space that opens up when you look at being, when you look at, ah, oh, what are we learning about how we can cultivate our true virtues and then what that allows about how we can organize ourselves and run society and address the big challenges. That's really exciting because fundamentally, well, political organizing debate, at its essence, you could say is about, direct, I would say, is addressing collective action problems. I mean, why do we come together in groups is to do things? I mean, at least in the, the, the formal sense of the state, you know, well, when it, maybe you might say it's just for exploitation at some point, but in the positive sense of why we have states, why do we come together and organize, is because we want to address collective action problems. I mean, be it self-defense, you know, we, we need to organize so we don't get attacked, but, or it might be to organize irrigation or to plant your crops or to build your house. We, we come together to solve collective action problems and to be bigger than we could be individually or even, you know, as the sum of our parts. And so I think that there's something very, so for me, that political, being a kind of, that political visioning and sharing that political visioning and the double sense of both, it opens up this possibility of a radically better world, a different kind of world. And I think it calls for focusing on transformating and cultivating being in what we do as a society far more than we do today. I mean, I, like this. I, don't, like, I don't like the term inner development that much. I prefer cultivating being, but making inner development a civilizational priority, which is a phrase I'm borrowing a little bit from work with Jamie Bristow. But that, that would be something so I'm actually when you can do it, who am I I'm also someone who's a little bit I like I don't think I'm that but there's a kind of I'm cool to many things and I have one thing I don't want to say I have any conflict but there's a it's such a joyous thing to have so many things but a, a question of where do I where do I contribute where should I what is the most useful way to be a service and also the most nourishing I mean it, I'll say also for me what's the most what's nourishing and finally, I would say, I think Rufus, I'm a fierce, I always used to say, like, I, I kind of like the Rinzai Zen more than I like the soft Zen. You know, I'm, but I'm fierce love. You know, I really love human beings. I always remember, like, even as a child, one of the things I wanted to do was when I had my kind of, inter when I did some work when I was a teenager, I mean, I worked on the farm. I grew up on a farm. It's a big thing, actually, in my life as well. Who am I? I grew up on a farm. I love nature. I love farming, in a way. But I used to work with children. That was one of the things I chose to do when I was 15, when I had my son was, and I love, I love people. And I love, I think children often, I'm autistic as well. Who am I? I'm on the spectrum. Maybe it's sometimes easier to work with children or something than adults. It's less complexity. But I just really love human beings. I really, really love people and care for people. And, you know, I know I love, since I was even small, I also wanted justice for people. I guess I wanted people to be treated decently. I always felt, Thanks, I think, to my parents who use credit of like radical equality, like no person for my parents, you know, it, it didn't matter if you were the cleaner or you were the CEO, it didn't matter, you know, in my father's office, my father was sort of, you know, in the world he was just sort of a bot, you know, but like it didn't matter, you were the, the tea lady or you were the most senior person, they were all the same as a human being. There's a thirst even maybe for justice of a kind, but I really love people and I have a fierce love. It's a fierce love. Uh, if I had my Chinese name, I can't remember what I am, but it would be like fierce. My wife is like, you know, true, you know, wild rose of hope. I think I'm like fierce love of transformation. Okay. So. Why don't I get it and why don't others get it? Why, what I mean in this way is for example, Let's say you take, just to, just to, sorry, so what question I said was why don't people kind of get it and why don't they act on it? And what do I mean by get it? So let's take one example. When I was younger, let's say I take seriously Buddhist enlightenment. Or, you know, even maybe whatever full enlightenment is, but like that you can really wake up. And all the stories like you can have peace beyond understanding, you know, you know discover the true nature of yourself or the world. Like, is there anything that sounds more awesome than that? And even if you're in the consumerist world, just like, you know, I can get anything in the store, you know, I, you know, even if that's not the way to think about Buddhism and all attachment, but it's like, 
then why wouldn't you go pursue that? And so why don't we go pursue that? Why did I not pursue awakening that much for many, many years? You know, I did some meditation, but it wasn't like a full on pursuit. And is that because I don't believe it's real? Is it because I doubt my own capacity to achieve? Whatever it is. But I think why don't people act on these things? You know, or take it, you know, take another tradition, you know, you're Christian and you really think there's, you know, a heaven in the way it's described, and it depends on how you're acting in this world and being a good Christian and so on, unless we're in the Protestant era. Why wouldn't you just really do that? Now, some of the answers that we start to discover about the nature of human nature, we talked a lot about, but I think a big insight, part of the answer is you do, I have, is that, oh, wow, you really don't pursue what you want. You know, the, the, the human nature is quite complicated. Like, there's a part of you can see those things, but there's another part that's like, give me the slice of pizza and I'm going to watch some Netflix. You know, anyone who's played a video game addictively sometimes in their life. I remember as a kid, like, one point, playing Civilization, you know, I kept saying, I'm going to go to bed. And it was something like, you know, it was 6 a.m. and the sun was coming up. You know, I had something to do the next day. But I think, I guess I still have, like, I, I feel that I'm probably a bit better at that, maybe, than other people, <laughs> relatively acting on what I think I should do. But why don't people do that? And why don't they then take commitment actions when they are in those states where they see what they should do to commit themselves? And then finally, like, why don't people, like, act on, you know, maybe on moving into community or things like that? So I guess that's a question I have of, like, why, why don't people do it? You know, even people I know quite well, why don't they act? And then not, like, not, like, why, like, making them wrong or making me wrong, but more like, ah, if I have insight into that why, I can act more skillfully. Like, I can support myself. If you like in that joke, you know, with one part of me talking to the other part of like, okay, I can, you know, not have the cigarettes in the house, metaphorically, you know, I can go book retreats, you know, or whatever I'm going to do that will support that part of me that has harder time acting and bring love to it, you know, but bring compassion, understanding. And similarly, I can be more skillful in the surrounding world of like, how do I enable people to act on what they seem to want to do or if they want to live more with around others in community that would support them why if they don't do that why don't they you know maybe it's that they've got you know they need to earn enough money you know in some way and they've got this concern about how do we deal with that how do we so there's this kind of why then leads to these kind of what is about what is behind that why not like oh why are they so stupid but why are we constrained in that way and how do we create greater freedom and I think one of the deepest things I come to in that, that then leads me is to, um, why don't we truly prioritize our children's upbringing? Because I think when you look, it's in the forming of our being. Now, of course, you could argue so to genetics and things, but why do I spend more time sorting out my accounts last year than maybe I spent researching how to educate my son? Why do we spend more time in society developing new iPhone than we spend on educate, you know, true educational research in the last year. Now that seems to me, maybe at the end of it, it's like why, that's another example though of prioritizing awakening, but why don't I do that? Why, and, and maybe, um, you know, why don't we prioritize that cultivation of being, especially for our children? <laughs> and again, not in a wrong way, not like, oh, why, why don't you do the right? But more like, ah, oh, you know, what, what is it? You know, what assumptions maybe do I have? Maybe that I can't make a difference. Or maybe I'm even afraid of my, my parent. You know, like, what I, you know, you know, it's a way of those things. Of course, you're always doing something by, by not doing anything. You know, when you're not doing something consciously or actively, you kind of avoid the response. You know, I don't mess my son up if I don't do it. I don't know. But yeah, why? Why don't I do that? And why don't we do that? Like, really... You know, especially in the first five years of life, just really give ourselves to our children. I mean, I know there's financial constraint things, but like in the time we have. So yeah, those are the kind of why questions I sit with. I, I mean, there's deeper whys, like, but yeah, there's other whys. Why is it so hard to be in relationship? <laughs> why, you know, to really be in a waking relationship, what does it mean to really become, to what it, you know, why is it hard to really be into being, even with your loved ones, really to see and then care for their needs as much as my own? And I would love that. That would be incredible. And there are moments you touch that. Oh, I have touched that. I don't know. But they're mainly often moments. 
But I think it's something, again, you cultivate, that, that deep love of the other and the kind of coming to be in some way a bit then, to really feel and see the world the way they see the world. Well, there's two ways that question also coming to it. So what is like political discourse or political activity look like? And like, what's the policy program or the, the vision? So I think, first of all, the crucial point of the second renaissance is maybe this primacy of being point generally, that to see we've neglected the cultivation of being, the development of culture as a kind of conscious process. We've not even seen it, I think, for, for, for a long time. I mean, you could say it was implicit, maybe, you know, Christianity and others, you cultivated the soul or, you know, you, you prayed and you did things. But I think in the sense that we now have and the, the, the kind of empirical scientific poten potential of it. One is the policy of the second race is the primacy of being, of a focus on cultivating being collectively. I, you know, we do it in a way in, in education already. We try and in some way form young minds. But to do that in a much wiser, deeper way, much more informed by the multiple dimensions of our, of our, of our nature. So not just cognitively, like with cognitive skills, but also, I would, dare I say, it, spiritual, contemplative skills, emotional skills, how to deal with trauma, how to deal with reactivity, how to deal with emotions that are coming up without having them overwhelm me. You know, I mean, these sim but these deep practices, you know, I often say they're simple, but they're like playing the piano. Playing the piano well takes years of practice. Similarly, but once you have that skill, it's, it's a joy for all your life. Similarly, the ability to manage emotions um, well takes maybe years of cultivation uh, of practice, but then you know, it's a joy for your whole life in terms of how you can interact with your partner, with others. So this politics of the second renaissance has that aspect. So I think, you know, in terms of policy programming, it would literally have, just as like environmentalism has become really central to our political programs, I, I think actually this aspect of how do we cultivate being and cultivate culture, what values do we want to have, would become really a central aspect of politics. I mean, it's, I think people can sound a bit odd about that, and I think I'm going to say something even more kind of controversial in a way, which I think, in a way, one of the great achievements of modernity was to kind of relegate the spiritual and the religious out of politics, out of the, the political sphere. And in many ways, that was a huge achievement. And I think, though, that in the, in the second renaissance, we need a way to reintegrate them in a well way. Because really, when you pursue that path, you end up with the, basically the world of the market. There are no ends to society. There are no shared values. We, the only value is basically more stuff so that we can each do what we want. De gustibus non est disputandum. You know, chacun a son goût. Basically, it's just vote, get what you, you know, just get more of what you want. And that isn't actually a political society. Society has to operate with some shared views and values. In fact, they are still there. I mean, reason why Western societies work, I think, in, in, that's not acknowledged, is that underneath that kind of market philosophy is still a lot of shared cultural heritage, a moral cultural heritage, you know, maybe no longer associated explicitly with Christianity, but a deep moral sense, a deep, which I think is built into human beings. It's more than just in Christianity, but was given a lot of form. So I think that we, that the other aspect of the politics of secular Renaissance is some really wise discussion about what, how do we integrate, I guess, shared values and shared views, and I say including even the transcendent, the transcendental, or so maybe use that instead of the spiritual, or, and even, you know, what, you know, if people say, but I think we can try and secularize them and make them very scientific, but what practices? You know, we need, I'm trying to think, I mean, the, take the United States, which is kind of the epitome of modernity, but it was born in a deeply religious environment that, created shared practices, shared trust, and so on. So I think one aspect of the politics of the Second Renaissance is that. So is how do we cultivate being? How do we come to agreement on the natures of being? That's a really big part of it. And I think that there are certain things that I would say, and I'm going to be as audacious as put them forward, that would show up as principles. 
that I do think ultimately can cross multiple faiths. I mean, in my case, I think there's particular, I view Buddhism for a variety of reasons because it was very empirically based, at least some varieties of Buddhism. They looked at human nature. So I think certain things are like interbeing as a principle. So the way that we are interdependent with others, that we are not these independent, while yes, we are individuals, it's not like somehow I merged with you, or I'm, you know, somehow, <laughs> It's not we're, we're some one entity, but there's some way in that we're much more deeply independent than I think that we tend to think of ourselves, at least in Western societies today. That I would like to say it's not a going back, it's a transcending of individualism and including of individualism, but something that will go beyond that. So I think that principle of inner being, you know, that term that's now coming in uh, to use, I think is one major principle of that. And I think that inner being just has so many implications at the level of even, you know, distribution of resources, you know, how we treat the environment, and so on. So I think that's one really uh, big aspect. I think, the, as I said, I've mentioned the principle that discussion of deep values, I mean, you could even include that spirituality, but, you know, there's been a tendency of modernity not only to remove religion, but to remove the discussion of deep value. I mean, that was almost the original agreement on religion, was like, we're not going to debate, you can be this denomination, you can be that denomination, but that then extended to much broader, like, you know, what do what is important? I think there's going to, another principle is that that is going to, that discussion of value and of deep value is going to be there in uh, a, a second, you know, second race or awakening societies. I think the other principle would be a view that human nature, that there are both aspects of it and that there's, there's transcendent aspects of it, so that's the spiritual dimension, but there are also cultivatable aspects that humans are evolvable, that we can evolve ourselves and our nature, even in our lifetimes, we can continue to develop beyond infancy and that we can transmit that and that that kind of ongoing evolutionary arc is really, well, it's, it's powerful, it's a powerful possibility and it's one that we can participate in. So I think the other principle is that cultivating being, you know, be that doing mindfulness in schools or learning how to manage our anger at the lat level, but even extending into much deeper ways, you know, looking into my nature, my true nature, you know, who is Rufus, who are you, those kind of things, that would be another principle. So inner being, you know, a focus, like a kind of caring about shared values and views and this view of the, the being can be cultivated that development can happen in adulthood as, or throughout our lives. That's another principle, I think, of the second Renaissance politics. Well, and I would say this primacy of being, for, for at least for, for this era, because we're in an era where we've had a primacy of, I would call it the material and the technological. I mean, I think another principle which is already getting there would, of course, be things like a, a, a more ecological type thinking, a more understanding of our, I feel that sometimes into being, but of our interwovenness and interdependence and a more less linear thinking would be also another principle. Now that brings me though to the other aspect of the politics of the second race, which is the very way, the, the, the process, what would, the, what would politics look like? And I think that's something again, I have less insight yet into. I think there are two things I can say. I think it depends a great deal on listening that this can only, there's a great deal of healing and work to be done to create the space to even have these discussions. Probably starting first of all in smaller groups and extending to the society. We're in a world at the moment of so much polarization often and reactivity. I mean, just say not just today, it's been that way for centuries in many ways. But this kind of thing that we're trying to do is different, has a different quality. Most of the previous victories are often that some new group comes to dominate the older group. And here, somehow, we're trying to include and take with us. So I think there's that aspect that it's really like listening. Funnily enough, listening is more important than the speaking. And I think the other is, I'm not sure, just to take another example, I'm not sure we'd have parties in the same way. I've been talking a lot with this colleague, Jamie Bristow, the other day, he was talking about collectives and art collectives. You know, you, don't have, you have movements in art, but you don't have like art parties, like kind of like getting voted in, you know, I think we'd be in a world of leadership and kind of leadership collectives to start with. You talk, he has this, we have this phrase of leadership as art. So I think that again, so I think there's something there about the forms of leadership that would start to come, come about. Communities of practice that would come about. 
I mean, just to remember the current party political system, to mention it, I mean, I'm going to be careful with my history, but really obviously only came into being over the last four or five centuries with modernity. You know, fame is the first kind of party system, was in, I think, roughly. And of course, there were factions back in ancient Greece. Any democratic system started to have them. But the more kind of parties that we have them today, which are different from what was there, I think, in ancient Athens, you know, evolved in, you know, after the, well, roughly the 17th century in England. I mean, you know, the great, you know, the glorious revolution, particularly, the Whigs and the Tories and so on. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, in a deep sense, there's some even connection, and it's a difficult to work out between cultivating being, like, this ability to hold different perspectives and to be, you know, parties are very much, I'm in this party. Like, I, you know, even if I don't agree with all the politics, I'm kind of like, it's very like X or Y. It's very much, I, I'm in one place now or I'm in another place. This ability to be fluid. Now, of course, there's a lot of things about having the simple zero or one or like I'm in this party or that party that's very functional. But that ability to have some fluidity in, in perspective, in position, um, on issues, on topics. But I just want to take, I mean, I don't know, and I, I think one of the ways, by the way, to tease some of this out in practice is also to pick concrete issues. I've talked in a lot of abstraction, but say, like, what would be a second Renaissance policy on abortion? You know, in one world, it's very simple, right? Say, it's women's rights, you know, I mean, or a debate between the rights of the fetus, if you're going to put it in rights terms, because even the Christian fundamentalists are forced actually to talk in rights terms, you know, the rights of the unborn or something, and the rights of the mother. You know, for example, you know, in, in the Sabine world, there are many people implicated. Of course, there's the, the, the child that's, on, that's not yet born. And, and what does that mean? You know, I mean, it doesn't have a voice, but it, 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 it's there, right? And there's the mother, and then there's the whole environment it's going to be born into. And that whole world is obviously altered by your views. If you kind of, if like me, I'm like, well, things are always manifesting and unmanifesting. I don't have quite such a strong thing about killing. I don't want to kill, but I don't have such a, you know, it's, you know, it's like thou shalt not kill. But at the same time, I suddenly see this fetus, uh, uh, unborn fetus, is a much richer kind of ecosystem of of, of emotions, of of world, of the people it's going to be born into. So, what is a second? What's a wise policy on abortion? You know, and is it a rule or is it like a process? Or is, you know, you know, I take something really controversial. What's a why? Is it in the future, would you have a system where, you know, you want to become a, a parent, not that there's necessarily a license or some rule of kind, but, you know, you're really encouraged by social norms and other things to really, like, have multiple people you talk to, to maybe identify not just your, the father and the mother, but multiple kind of parents, you know, that you're going to be born into a community. You know, you can imagine things like this, but what, what do those policies look like? So I want to end there because I think, but I think that those kind of questions is where you start to see, you can tease out what do those principles actually mean in practice? What, you know, what does it mean to apply in a being in, to becoming a parent? What does it mean to apply in a being to how we deal with criminality, if you like? You know, what, what is criminality? You know, the going, you know, just take that final example, you know, transcending, they're like, oh, it's society, so they're not culpable, or no, it's their nature, you know, the, this kind of like, the conservative story is like, they should be punished, they're, you know, it's their responsibility, or the kind of liberal story of like, but they had a bad upbringing, you know, look at all the people around, you know, very few people from upper, upper middle class suburbs go, <laughs> go to jail for stealing, you know, maybe they should just, they just steal on Wall Street or something is the story, but you know, it's transcending, the, 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 both are true, right? I mean, I think that's actually last story would be non-duality. I think that would be another principle of real understanding the West of non-duality in, in a subtle sense of it would be another great principle. So, yeah, I think the politics of the second Renaissance is we already have a flavor of it, I would say. I'm always cautious because when you give people a flavor, they always then start to, when people, you're always encouraging people to then disagree with whatever the flavor you said. But I think that you, you can feel it. And I think this fundamentally, this focus on the nature and cultivation of being, which I feel that opening up that ontological area, which we have those assumptions in the political system we have today, when you open those up, you know, I say the sacred cow of today is, I know what I want. That makes me, I can be a consumer and I can be a voter. If you truly start to question that, that I don't know, and, and people get very scared, they're like, oh, but is that the false consciousness of Marxism, that, you know, therefore I know better than you what you want. No, but like, as I say, there's an incredible talk, for example, by Thich Nhat Hanh, where he just straight up says, well, of course you don't know what you really want. Where he's arguing with an engineer at Google. The engineer at Google is, is saying to him, you know, why we should just give people the option 
to kind of control notification on phone. And Thich Nhat Hanh's kind of saying, no, no, you should actually kind of turn them off by default. You know, not that you shouldn't allow people to then turn them back on, but he's kind of, and he's just but like, that would be interfering with their choice. He's like, what free will? Almost. Thich Nhat Hanh, he's saying a more subtle thing than that. But he's really questioning the sacred cow of modernity, which is we know, I, Rufus, I'm an individual, I know what I want, don't tell me what to do. And what I think that go back to the cultivation of being is to discover you don't know, and not to be told by someone else, but to discover in a way you, what you truly want is a real skill. And then to truly act on it takes environment and skill. And that insight is huge and it blows up most assumptions of modern political economy, if you take it seriously. And it, as I just explained, it doesn't have to lead back into, oh, then some other group know better, which is the danger of Plato. The whole trap that people, you know, you know Plato, you know, Popper's whole critique of Plato as fascist, in a way, because, you know, in that one, the philosopher kind of kings know better and so on, is it's more about, though, why that there are wisdom teachers who are not telling you what to do, but enabling you to discover what you truly, what your true need true heart wisdom is telling you.